Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Triple N Media. I am Dr. Nick Nickam, a cardiologist from Houston, Texas. The feature presentation is Cardiology Board EKG Interpretation Tips. So I'm going to look at the actual cardiology answer key template and go through them step by step and try to highlight some of the things that we need to be paying attention to when we are interpreting electrocardiograms during a cardiology EKG section of the cardiology boards. And I do welcome you to watch more than 300 lectures I have on my YouTube channel under cardiology seminars. So let us, uh, you can look at my YouTube channel here, which is Nick Nickham. And uh, we have more than 300 lectures covering various topics uh, in the field of cardiology, including the ACCAH guidelines from 2014 all the way to 2022, the most recent of which is the heart failure guidelines. Please do watch them and hopefully this will help you to better prepare for your cardiology board exams. Here you can see, follow my green arrow here. Before I go any further, I would like to tell you I have put together 250 pages of uh, cardiology useful information, tables, medications, uh, and guidelines, and flowcharts, uh, and you can get a free copy of this, and I'll tell you how you can get a free copy of this at the end of this presentation. And here's an EKG book. Here's an EKG book I have written. You can check this on Amazon.com, but you don't need to, because my YouTube channel has all the chapters in this book uh, explained in a step-by-step -step manner. Okay, let us proceed with uh, Whenever, when you are sitting for the cardiology board exam, the EKG section will have a series of EKGs with a very brief history. And then you are supposed to interpret this electrocardiogram in two to three minutes. Pay particular attention to the history. There may be a point in the history that could point to a special finding in the electrocardiogram that may have the maximum points. So let's not underestimate a word or a phrase in the history that may be the clue to the differential diagnosis as to what we are trying to accomplish by interpreting these electrocardiograms. Here is the answer key template. It may look different from year to year, but this is the general format that is being followed by the American Board of Internal Medicine cardiology section. It is going to have the general section involving the P wave abnormalities. And then we have the atrial rhythms, junctional rhythm, ventricular rhythms. We have condu conduction system evaluation, hypertrophy and axis changes, and these metabolic changes like digitalis, potassium, calcium, magnesium, hypothermia, and a whole bunch of other things, including pericarditis, which we are going to talk about. Then we have the intraventricular conduction delays, which may be incomplete bundle branch block, right, left bundle branch block, entry hemi block, posterior hemi block, you name it, everything is going to be covered. The most important topic is going to be myocardial infarction. You need to know precisely the location of the myocardial infarction, what leads represent those areas, whether this is acute or whether this is probably an old infarct. The biggest problem comes uh, during STT abnormality evaluation, because when you code for an acute anterior myocardial infarction, do you code for ischemia or injury or, uh, or disturbances or reciprocal changes? I know you don't get reciprocal changes. Yes, you do. If you have an anterior MI, you may see reciprocal changes in the opposite leads. So we have to make sure we understand that clearly because there could be points that we could either gain or lose by not appropriately coding the STT changes in the presence of a myocardial infarction or a bundle branch block or whatever condition you're dealing with. Of course, QT interval, prominent U waves. So these are all things. And pacemakers, you need to know the difference between a ventricular pacemaker and a dual chamber pacemaker. And you need to know pacemaker malfunction in terms of sensing, in terms of pacing, and in terms of capture. Remember all these things. I know it's too much to remember in one slide here, but let's break this down into separate segments and see what 
things we need to pay attention to. First, we're going to focus upon P wave abnormalities. I would say every time you are reading an EKG, get a scratch pad and write down all the findings that you obviously see: sinus rhythm, sinus arrhythmia, or uh, artifacts, or muscle tremors. You write it down because uh, at the end we are trying to circle those or mark those boxes. You may forget the points. Generally, there are anywhere from five to seven or eight points uh, on each electrocardiogram. So you want to make sure you get at least five or six of them so that uh, you want to get your 85% uh, marks so that you can get through this board exam and you don't have to worry about it until the next, for the next 10 years. Okay, the first thing you need to look at is, is this a normal sinus rhythm? Is this sinus arrhythmia? And we need to know the criteria for sinus arrhythmia. Then electrolyte, uh, electrode misplacement, the most frequent of which are the limb leads, right and left limb leads being exchanged where these leads re reverse their polarity. And chest leads, this is, I have seen it the most often where in an obese patient, instead of putting the leads below in the fifth or sixth intercostal space, they put it in the second intercostal space. So every lead in the chest will look like QS complex giving a false impression of an anterolateral myocardial infarction or loser. So keep that in mind because when you're looking at it, you need to see where the changes are and how they affect it. Then of course, left atrial enlargement, if it is more than one box of 40 milliseconds and one millimeters in height. And if you see a biphasic P wave, you see right atrial enlargement. If it is associated with right ventricular hypertrophy, it becomes more significant. And those are the things that we need to be paying attention in this particular box. So I would say when you're doing the EKG interpretation, go through each box step by step. And when you do hundreds of these, then you can very quickly go through, okay, the, sinus rhythm, I don't see any change in P waves, I don't see any um, atrial abnormalities, okay, I don't see muscle tremors, nothing, next, go on to the next one, okay, the next deals with the atrial arrhythmias, atrial arrhythmias could be sinus rhythm, sinus arrhythmia, it could be sinus tachycardia, it could be sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia, we have bradycardia too, sinus pauses, atrial tachycardia, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia. We need to know the rate range for each one of these. Atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, multifocal atrial tachycardia. All these things you have to have memorized. Or I would say, uh, produce a PowerPoint presentation like I have done with an EKG that matches each one of these conditions. So when you put all these things together, you have your own library of EKG interpretations because you already know what a sinus bradycardia EKG looks like or a sinus arrhythmia EKG looks like or a sinus multifocal atrial tachycardia looks like. And when you see those things, when you have seen it, you can interpret it the next time. So it may take a little exercise. You can just go to Google Images and pull up these EKGs or when you're reading EKGs, save a copy of abnormal EKGs, for example, right axis deviation, acute pulmonary embolus, where you see certain features like S2, S3, things like that, or uh, SGT changes in the anterior leads. So when you see those things, collect them, put them in a PowerPoint, you may have like three, 400 EKGs, but you have the best library needed to prepare for your cardiology EKG interpretation section. So atrial flutter with the uh, regular intervals or varying or our intervals uh, and of course atrial fibrillation. So keep in mind, are you dealing with supraventricular tachycardia or a ventricular tachycardia? When you have a wide QRS tachycardia, is this supraventricular or ventricular? If there's underlying bundle branch block or rate dependent bundle branch block, you may be dealing with a supraventricular tachycardia because the treatment differs. If you are dealing with a patient with a WPW with an accessory pathway where the tachycardia is coming through the accessory pathway, you don't want to use uh, drugs that block the AV node because that can increase the rate uh, through the accessory pathway. Okay, now we move on to the next segment of that uh, answer key, AV junctional rhythm and ventricular arrhythmias. AV junctional, AV junction, what can we see? Junctional bradycardia, junctional escape rhythm, junctional tachycardia, or uh, junctional arrhythmia. Here we look for P waves, we don't see any P waves. 
we have a narrow QRS complex, so this is not ventricular rhythm. It is pretty slow rate, and we have a narrow QRS complex. We don't see any P waves, and maybe we could say we are seeing a retrograde P wave here, and I guess that's the only lead I see it. So those are the things we had to interpret, but not only that, you also need to interpret these STT changes when we get to that segment I'll mention. Because very often we see the obvious thing and say, oh, this is escape junction rhythm. I am done. I don't see any P waves. I don't see any uh, wide QRS. So I'm done. No, you're not done because we have these STT changes. They are not they are not part and parcel of a junction rhythm. That's why you need to be interpreting those things. And does this patient have like left ventricular hypertrophy with strain pattern? See what I'm trying to say? You have to get the whole global picture. That's why I put down five or six points that you see in the electrocardiogram so that uh, you pretty much cover most of uh, what you're expected to know. Next, ventricular arrhythmias. Premature ventricular beats, couplets, triplets, short bursts of ventricular tachycardia. And again, when we are dealing with this in a patient with atrial fibrillation, be aware of Ashman phenomenon. What is an Ashman phenomenon? Just Google it and read it. Everything is explained in your cardiology textbook. So we have to know, but here, as you can see, we, we see a P wave here. I'm not sure we see a P wave here. Then we have bursts of uh, what looks like ventricular tachycardia. Yeah, this looks like a sinus rhythm with a, with a PVC precipitating a ventricular tachycardia. And these are things that we should be able to identify. We may also have accelerated ventricular rhythm, which is most often seen in patients with inferior myocardial infarction with a high vagal tone. And usually they respond to just medical management. Next, we move on to atrioventricular conduction disturbances. First degree AV block, second degree Wenckebach or uh, high grade second Mobitz type 2 block. Uh, and AV block 2 to 1. When you see 2 to 1 AV block, we don't know whether it's Wenckebach or whether it's uh, Mobitz type 2. It's very hard to differentiate. And complete heart block or high grade AV block. You just need to know what is asked here and you don't need to know esoteric blocks and things like that because that's not what's going to be asked in your examination. And here we see a P wave. I don't see anything else down here. I Maybe a P wave here, maybe a P wave here, maybe a P wave here, P wave here. It looks like we got, you have to say this is sinus rhythm. Then you have to say there is AV dissociation and there is complete heart block with the escape. Uh, it could be a junctional or a ventricular Idioventricular, it is very slow. I would say it's a escape idioventricular rhythm. So, th those are the things that we have to say. And of course, this STT changes because it's a ventricular rhythm may not be significant uh, unless you're dealing with a like a junction rhythm with the STT changes. So, we see a AV dissociation, and we also need to be aware of WPW, which can mimic uh, like high R waves in inferior leads, anterior leads, it can mimic anterior infarct, it can mimic inferior infarct. Next, voltage. When we are talking about voltage, there are a lot of conditions that can cause low voltage like hypothyroidism, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, cardiomyopathies, severe congestive heart failure with a lot of myocardial scarring. And all these things can cause low voltage. We need to know the criteria. Less than 5 millimeters in the limb leads, less than 7 millimeters or 10 millimeters in the chest leads. I don't know the exact number, but you can check it out. Then we have to do the axis deviation. Here we have a totally negative QRS complex. That means we have a left axis deviation. If the left axis is greater than minus 45 degrees, we also need to include left anterior hemiblock. Remember, you can code both left axis deviation and left anterior hemiblock. You can have both at the same time, but uh, you just can't have a left axis deviation, which is uh, like less than 45 degrees and add left anterior hemiblock to that because that is not uh, the right axis deviation is seen in patients with COPD or in patients with uh, pulmonary embolus or in patients with uh, 
congenital heart disease and here is an example of a right axis deviation when you see a negative deflection in lead 1 which is more than the R wave deflection uh, along if it is associated with some degree of right atrial enlargements and some right ventricular hypertrophy that may sort of confirm your diagnosis of uh, right ventricular hypertrophy with right axis deviation. And along with that, we also have some voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy and some STT changes. These are non-specific STT changes. We'll come to that in a minute. So keep in mind that we have to interpret everything in the electrocardiogram. I'm just going through one step at a time here. So we have a left ventricular hypertrophy by voltage criteria. There's no left atrial enlargement. We have a right axis deviation here from what we can see and some STT changes. Let's move on to, here's an example of a left axis deviation and left anterior hemiblock. Why do I say left anterior hemiblock? If this is isoelectric, the axis is minus 30. But since there's much more negative deflection, that means the axis is going more towards left, which will be like more than 45 degrees. So that accounts for the left anterior hemiblock. So I would quote this as the left axis deviation, left anterior hemiblock. And also look at this, the one, two, three, almost 20 millimeters of R wave in lead one AVL, which may also suggest uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. We don't have the voltage criteria here, but again, it depends upon where these chest leads are placed. But nonetheless, the left axis deviation carries three points. We have the ABL, which carries a significant amount of uh, weight. So putting these together, I would say there is suggestion of a left ventricular hypertrophy in a patient with a sinus rhythm and a first degree AV block. And uh, I don't know if you covered blocks. Uh, in a, remember I mentioned about first degree AV block and here we see the PR interval is greater than 200 milliseconds. That's uh, five boxes. Okay, next we see an example of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, when we are talking about left ventricular hypertrophy, there is what's called the Scarborough's uh, criteria. It is fully explained in every tech cardiology book, EKG books and all these things. You can look it up. You need to memorize those uh, findings because this is where most of us get tricked. Here we see left ventricular hyper... Let me get my... Here we see left ventricular hypertrophy, high voltage in lead one, high voltage in ABL, this high R, S, R combination of more than 35 millimeters and discordant STT or hypertrophy with strain. I'll come in the next slide and explain this one. Strain. And all of this put together suggests left ventricular hypertrophy. We would have liked to see some left atrial abnormality or enlargement. The, the terminology keeps changing. First they thought it was enlargement, now they just said this is just an electrical phenomenon, so this is left atrial abnormality. Whatever you want to call it, it's, it's uh, your fancy. And uh, the STT changes may help us in identifying myocardial ischemia in the presence of left bundle branch block or left ventricular hypertrophy if the STT changes behave differently. This is the normal STT changes of uh, hypertrophy with strain that is downsloping ST segment with symmetrically inverted T waves. I'm highlighting some of these important points because they are the subtle points where we, they're going to trick us. All right, here's an example of a right axis deviation and right ventricular hypertrophy. And let's see, there is some prominent P wave also here. So it, it, we could be dealing with a patient with a right ventricular hypertrophy, right axis deviation, and possible right atrial enlargement. It's only one millimeter or so, or two millimeters, you can't be really sure. Then these changes are again reciprocal changes to the left ventricular hyper, right ventricular hypertrophy. All right, let's move on to, here's a right bundle branch block. You can see an RSR prime with the secondary STT changes. So, so these are not ischemic changes. The axis seems to be okay. It's a sinus rhythm, PR interval is okay. And so this is how we try to narrow down and write down sinus rhythm. Voltage is okay. Right bundle branch block and uh, that's all we see here. Let's move on to the next one. Here's an example of a left bundle branch block where we have the wide QRS in one AVL V5 to V6. 
of greater than 120 milliseconds with uh, discordant STT changes. So sometimes we see these biphasic TVO changes, which is uh, part of the bundle branch block pattern. And uh, we also have deep S waves, or yes, deep S waves, not Q waves actually. You see a tiny R wave here. And this is a classic example of a left bundle branch block. We can have left bundle branch block without left axis deviation, or we could have left bundle branch block with left axis deviation also, which may suggest a higher level of left bundle branch block, which may be more ominous, ominous which may be more suggestive of a proximal occlusion. All right, so let's move on to the next one. And a whole host of metabolic problems we need to be aware of. Brugada syndrome, the typical RS or prime with the ST, uh, downsloping ST segment and T-wave inversion. You just have to memorize that. Get a copy of the EKD from the website or from some presentations and save it in your library, the one which I was talking to you about, creating an EKG for every one of these diagnoses in a PowerPoint and just read them. Digitalis toxicity, you should know the STT changes related to digitalis toxicity along with the premature ventricular complexes, torsod. You can pass a cardiology board without identifying torsod. Hyperkalemia, tall peaked uh, tomb-like t waves, hypokalemia, bradycardia, low voltage, U waves, uh, hypercalcemia, short QT interval, dextrocardia, you know, right-sided chest leads, pericardial effusion, swinging heart, electrical alternance, low QRS voltage, and these are the things, pericarditis. I haven't put a, an example of a pericarditis. Pericarditis is where we see diffuse ST segment elevation in multiple leads and one of the, the characteristic features of that is a, a drop in the P or interval. So if they give you a young person, 30, per, 30 year old person with uh, wake fever and chest pain of uh, three days duration comes in, has a difficulty with positioning and this is the EKG they give you and there may be a classic SP or depression. Keep that in mind and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, of course, you can see big uh, T-web inversions in the anterior leads due to septal hypertrophy. So these are hypothermia is another important thing. And all of these things, I said, collect the electrocardiograms now, because this is all you need to know for cardiology boards. So why not prepare them in the right manner? Next, we're gonna move on to the location of the end fault. This is where the terminology varies depending upon which institution you had your fellowship or which institution you're going to or when you're taking the board exam and who wrote that question. It's not the question of whether you're right or wrong. It's the question of are you answering what the board exam is asking you for. For example, one and AVL is the high anterior, which is in the region of the diagonal branch. Inferior leads, of course, represent the right coronary artery or the posterior branch of the left circumflex artery. Antroseptal is V1 to V4, which represents the left anterior descending artery, and V4 to V6 are the lateral chest leads, which represent the circumflex marginal branches. But occasionally, we may see a, a patient with a, an anterolateral infarct and an inferior infarct. How could this be possible? Think about it. One third of the inferior apical region of the left ventricle is supplied by the distal territory, distal uh, branches of the left anterior descending artery. So if you have a very large proximal anterior artery collusion, you can have a high anterior infarct, you can have an anteroseptal infarct, you can even have changes in the lateral walls because of the diagonals and some part of the apex because the distal third of the apex is supplied by the distal branches of the left anterior descending artery. So we need to keep that in mind. So that's as far as the acute my STEMI changes are concerned, you, the location. But it's not that difficult. You have to look at anterolateral, which will be like one AVL V5 to V6. Anterior or anteroseptal is V1 to V4. Lateral is V5, V6. Inferior is the 2, 3 AVF. And posterior is the reciprocal changes we see in the anterior leads. I think I have an example of that, which I'm going to show you shortly. The next problem comes in with, uh, oh, here's an example uh, 
of an acute inferior myocardial infarction and also right bundle branch block. And of course, there is a sinus rhythm, There's the rate is slow, and we see some STD changes. So if you go back to the next EKG here, and when we are dealing with the STTU wave abnormalities, memorize each one of these and be ready to check the right box. If you have an acute myocardial infarction, they expect you to mark STT abnormality suggesting myocardial injury. Myocardial injury is ST elevation, whereas the myocardial ischemia is ST inversion. In ST depression and T wave inversion and those are things and the secondary changes are due to right bundle branch block or the left bundle branch block and normal variation of T waves, uh, non-specific STT abnormalities, diffuse ST elevation which I already mentioned to you about or if you can you get a 40 year old African American male who comes with hypertension you do a routine electrocardiogram he has 2 millimeter ST elevation in multiple leads it could be just an early repolarization or a normal variant. Prominent U waves are seen in patients with uh, hypokalemia and here's a patient with a left bundle branch block with uh, typical strain pattern. We see that in bundle branch block, we see that in left ventricular hypertrophy. On the other hand, if this person comes with chest pain and we see the ST segment is up and the T waves are inverted, that is suggestive of an acute injury pattern on top of left bundle branch block. We may not be able to convincingly say that's what it is but if we have a previous electrocardiogram and if the previous electrocardiogram look like this now you see the ST elevation and T wave inversion that is an indication of a STEMI and that patient needs to go to the cat lab. Anyway if this person comes with chest pain with a new onset left one branch block still you would take them to the cat lab to rule out any evidence of uh, acute coronary occlusion. Okay pacemakers. It's a very long, complex topic, but uh, first we need to know, are we dealing with a VVI pacemaker, just ventricular pacemaker, or are we dealing with a dual chamber pacemaker? And this is an example of a dual chamber. We see two electrical spikes here, atrial spike, P waves, ventricular spike, and QRS complex. The impulse, uh, as you can see, is uh, showing two pacing electrode deflections. Then we need to know, is there a problem with the sensing? If it's not sensed, that means if there's a pause, the pacemaker is not kicking in. That's sensing. And is there a problem in pacing? The pacing problem may be related to battery. And that's something we need to be concerned about. Or is there a failure in capture? When would we see a failure in capture? If the lead is sitting on a myocardial scar, it may not capture. So those are some of the things we must be able to identify. Most of the time we should be able to pinpoint and see what is happening. Is this a failure to sense? Is it a failure to pace? Or is it a failure to capture? And those things, I mean, it's beyond the scope of this presentation, but make sure you get copies of those electrodes, which are like uh, sensing failure pacing failure and uh, capturing failure. So those are things you need to have separate e collect EKGs so you know exactly what you're looking at when you see something like that uh, in your uh, actual board exam. So ladies and gentlemen, in summary, I concluded, I, I mean, I covered each one of these in small segments and highlighting some of the things that uh, we have seen over the years that uh, have been tested time and again, like myocardial infarction, ischemia, injury, reciprocal changes, uh, same thing with low voltage, pericarditis, uh, bundle branch blocks, complete heart block, Wenke block versus type 2 versus uh, high degree AB block, and of course arrhythmias, WPW, a whole bunch of things. I hope this has been educational to you, and please, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. And here's an example of an acute inferior myocardial infarction. And do you see anything else here? Just pause this for a few seconds and, and tell me if you see anything else. We, we see acute inferior infarct. Generally, we should not see this degree of reciprocal changes in the anterior chest lids.
if you see significant ST depression and T wave inversion in the anterior leads in a patient with an inferior infarct, we also need to be thinking about uh, posterior involvement. The way to look at this is to flip the CKG or put it in front of a mirror and I have a one that looks like that and his EKG which is flipped now we can see a classic picture of a ST elevation and T wave inversion and of course we are looking at anteriorly but this is coming from the posterior wall that's why we it looks like uh, the one we see here so that is, is a tricky question and you are going to get something like this uh, uh, I don't know if it's your luck or uh, maybe the next person's luck. So be aware of when you see an inferior MI, always think about posterior wall involvement. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this presentation. I told you we have more than 300 presentations on cardiology topic in our on our YouTube channel. Please do watch them. And the way to get a free copy of this uh, PDF uh, 250 pages of chock full of information. All the homework has been done for you by just sending an email to drnicknickham at gmail.com. Thank you so much for watching this presentation and I will see you in the next presentation. Have a good day. Merry Christmas to you.